Let's talk about Moon Knight. Marvel is quickly becoming that mercurial crackhead that hangs around the bus stop that you need to go to to get to the other side of town. <laughs> you know that dazed, drugged out guide or gal, I'm gender inclusive with my crack addiction hypotheticals, but Marvel is that aimless vagabond that will go months and months spouting trite nonsense to the air about an all-female Russian Illuminati, or interdimensional magical Chinese people, or suspiciously attractive cyborgs that fight rainbow thread monsters and keep the earth from having a giant god baby. But that same crackhead, every once in a blue moon, will thrust upon your ear something genius. This nigh incomprehensible gender non-binary drug addict will spin you a yarn about assassins and incarcerated gods and a failing marriage and a tortured conscience and a man who is struggling with the abuse of a mother soaked in grief. That is what Moon Knight is. And that is what Marvel has chosen to do with its latest big budget Disney Plus TV series. Marvel, as a production studio, or whatever it is, heck, it could be a self-aware entity by now, but it really has mastered the art of being terrible on Monday, mediocre on Wednesday, and truly fascinating by Friday. Some of the stuff they put out, like WandaVision or Spider-Man Homecoming, is legitimately inspired and deals with issues through the lens of superheroes that extend far past I need to punch the villain harder. It's explorations of grief and regret and the human condition and all the gross grimy stuff that even the best of us have to deal with. Moon Knight is a continuation of this and as a show it's just really good. And of course there is a lot more to say about it and I will say a lot more about it, but if there's one thing to take away from this video, it's that. Moon Knight is not a waste of time. There are like six episodes in the first season. You could legitimately watch the entirety of the show across like a single Saturday, or if you're circa 2000s era Michael Phelps, across a single 24 course meal. Fun fact, I finished episode five of Moon Knight while soloing an entire rotisserie chicken and only felt a little bit of shame while looking at the greasy flesh bared mangled corpse left on my plate. But aside from the gluttonous habits that will certainly catch up to me when I'm older, Moon Knight was a consistent joy to watch and while definitely not perfect, it deserves the hype as one of Marvel's best better forays into unique, lesser-known comic fictions. So, like I said, there are a lot of praises to go around for Moon Knight, but I would have to be dented in the head not to start with Oscar Isaac picking up this entire season and putting it on his meaty shoulders. The man was incredible. Like, obviously, I already knew that Oscar Isaac was a great actor from his work in Ex Machina and his jaw-dropping 13.2 seconds in Dune, but I gotta say, I would never have thought that a freaking Marvel show would have a storyline nuanced and evocative enough to pull out an actor's best talent. Whatever soylent green sludge Disney is force feeding to its cage menagerie of reusable actors, Oscar Isaac must be getting the same thing that Willem Dafoe got when he reprised his role as Green Goblin because those men put on a tour de force when it came to wearing two different faces. Like I'm not too worried about spoiling the show because if you clicked on this video you should have definitely finished it by now, but there were some scenes where I genuinely had to remind myself that Stephen Grant and Mark Spector were the same person. Like, I know a lot of that comes down to makeup and special effects and camera work, but it's undeniable that Oscar Isaac was using every trick in his acting fanny pack to convincingly portray two different personalities. Steven is this sweet, awkward spaz, and Mark is a hardened, walled-off mercenary, but I never saw any bleed-through between the two characters with Oscar Isaac's performance, even when he had to switch between Steven and Mark in single takes. I'm not going to go as far as to say it's one of the top tier acting performances I've seen that still belongs to the likes of Eddie Redmayne as Stephen Hawking and LeBron James as LeBron James, but it's a wholly convincing enactment of two personalities inhabiting one body, and my non-existent hat is very much tipped to Oscar Isaac for his work. And following that, the most impressive aspect of the show, at least for me, was the restraint that the story showed in its first four episodes by keeping up the mystery of what the heck was going on. It was framed as the Mickey-eared wearing love child of Shutter Island and The Mummy, and I very much rolled my eyes at that description because I don't trust Marvel to pull off something like that at all. Just so you guys know, I'm a massive fan of psychological dramas. I could go all Jägermeister frat party bro who took one semester of media studies and talk about Christopher Nolan's Memento, and don't get me wrong, that movie is awesome, but there are also other mind-bending films like The Babadook which play with the is it or is it not reality of horror. I adore movies like Black Swan or The Lighthouse that put forth these unreliable narrators and perspectives so that we as viewers become just as confused and disoriented as those within the fiction. And to get back to Moon Knight specifically, I didn't think Marvel was going to do that. Most of their stuff up until this point had been pretty straightforward, and I was very much prepared for Moon Knight to be more of the same. But it wasn't. Those first four episodes ooze confidence because they barely tell you diddly or squat. Instead of expositing all over my chest, the show ferries me through what I need to know by showing me Steven's life. 
I learn about his struggles and his predicaments through the slow drip feed of visual and experiential information. I am honestly so thankful that this was a four and a half hour TV series and not a 120 minute big screen movie because I guarantee that the introduction and midsection would have been truncated into either another milk toast bland as butter beans action adventure comedy quip fest or an incoherent mess of learn words and Egyptian flavored exposition. But instead, by utilizing that extra time, we get this really weird and engaging slow burn that has us questioning who Steven is, if what he's seeing is even real, and if Mark and Khonshu can even be trusted. And that, of course, leads us to the inarguable highlight of the show, episodes 4 and 5. It's at that point that Moon Knight puts all of its cards on the table and really doubles down on the whole unreliable narrator concept. Mark being a patient at an asylum is a very cool twist that forces us viewers to question what is even happening. And then the show transitions to its emotional peak by showing Mark's history and why Steven even exists. It's the decades of guilt over the death of his own brother and his inability to cope with the trauma that his abusive mother forced him into. I cannot overstate this enough. It's so cool that Mark and Steven's origin story isn't falling into a vat of acid or being bitten by a radioactive Egyptian god. It's just trauma. Their origin is the unfortunate ugliness of life happening to people, and those same people being forced into their own ugly solutions. Episode 5 felt more like the entire climax of the show, because in actuality it kinda was. Again, the whole Egyptian god kaiju fight was a literal backdrop to the struggle and character growth that Steven and Mark were going through. They were the center of the narrative. Amit and her plan to guzzle the world's soul was simply a motivating catalyst to put Mark and Steven into action. And with all that said, it's time to get to the parts of the show that were less great. Granted, nothing was like bad, but just less good. Ethan Hawke was actually very compelling as Dr. Harrow. The eerie initial scene of him putting the glass into his shoes was never explained, but it goes a long way of showing his personality, right? His need for penance and retribution. He's not a bad guy, even though he's a villain. He's just so deep into the Kool-Aid that he can't find the ladle anymore. Now, his devotion to Amit is pretty cliche. We have definitely had fanatical, God-fearing worshippers before, but I think it's his, like, sick kindness and soft nature that make him stand out a bit. Where I wish I'd saw a little bit more, and the show got very close to it, actually, was his conversation with Amit. All of his screen time up until that point had been a constant current of why he was on his journey. Amit judges the unbalanced and protects those who are good. It was kind of the whole purpose for his living. So when Amit deems Hero himself unbalanced but refuses to judge him for her own personal gain, I was expecting that to be a much bigger blow to his character. The god who he had devoted his life to was no better than all the people she was judging. It just seemed like a really high potential moment that the show glossed over. Another thing that I thought was weird was the explanation of Steven's memories of his mother. Like, Steven only had good memories of his mom, but clearly we see that Steven was created as a defense mechanism for the beatings and trauma that Mark would receive. If anything, Steven should be the one with trauma since he took the beatings so Mark didn't have to. Again, that whole storyline is still very moving, but it does become a little weird upon scrutiny. And finally, I thought Layla was... okay. I... you know, okay. I never found myself interested in her as a character. Really, I think her involvement in the narrative was more predicated on her being a tool to cause doubt for Mark's morality and trustworthiness. The death of her father puts this constant pall over Mark's intentions, and while it definitely serves its needs in making Mark mysterious, it's a bit disappointing that that's the majority of what she brings to the story. I'm not even sure what I wanted to see from her, but there was definitely more potential there. Regardless though, I was very pleased during my short time with Moon Knight. It was a much more mature, bloody Marvel story that also had the cojones to deal with domestic violence and psychological harm. From the look of the post credit scene, which should have definitely been part of the main runtime, it appears that we'll be getting a season 2 as well. I think Moon Knight is one of those Disney Plus shows that can definitely stand shoulder to shoulder with the higher level, big screen Marvel movies, and I wait with bated breath to see how the production team will handle it going forward. So that's pretty much it. This is like my first review of a TV show, um, and I definitely want to be able to do more. So if you guys just tell me what you want to see, what you want me to talk about, along with my other kind of like more writing based videos, I'll definitely be able to record those for you. So as always, it was a pleasure, and I'll talk to you all again soon.